Good gracious. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I have a really temperamental little sound system that decides whether or not uh, I can play music, which, I'm not going to lie, it's not helping my mood very much. Uh, but anyway, hi, how are you? How the devil are you? Um, I'm good. I'm going to... Uh, I, I'm going to say a few things about the CAS report review. Uh, a few things. Um, we are better off today than we were yesterday. But it's not enough. It's not as far as we should have gone. Uh, I think waiting four years for something that most of us have been saying with much stronger language for all that time is uh, necessary. Um, I think that they didn't mention, uh, the cast review doesn't mention porn, doesn't really go into social aspects, perhaps that's not its job. Um, and I think that going along with any amount of the language is truly terrifying and unnecessary. And let's face it, this is a review. This is not implementation. This is recommendations. There's nothing in this report that means that any ideologically captured government can't just ignore it. Um, so there is much to do. And, and I also know that for some people, this is as far as they want to go. And they think that this is one. They are celebrating victories. They are patting each other on the back. They are dusting their little hands and saying that we are good now. All is done. And if you're one of them, Best of luck to you. Have a great life. For me, it's just not enough. Um, and there is much work to do. And I will continue to be asking for the things that I've been asking for all along. Um, and even if that review was both really hard line and was going to get implemented next week, Still doesn't stop a man's penis being exposed in your female-only space. Still doesn't stop your children being taught about this at school. It still doesn't stop um, the like the Women's Institute being co-opted. It doesn't stop the government being co-opted. It doesn't stop the police being co-opted or the judiciary. It doesn't mean there won't be a, a huge amount of flags being flown from NHS buildings. Um, and also... It won't stop the NHS contacting me, trying to make me stop my parody stickers, uh, which I feel is a fundamental right as being a funny British person. Um, I should be able to do that. So if you are satisfied, if you're happy, then I'm, you know, I'm happy for you. But I don't like anybody in a position of power using the words gender identity, gender dysphoria, gender-related stress, um, and maybe there was somewhere buried in the report some really good hardline ideas about what, what those things mean. Um, but I think to produce a report in a medical kind of setting that requires evidence and so on, and using that sort of language, for me it's not okay. I don't, I don't feel um, that great about it. However, like I said, there is now a touch point in which if we talk about this country and how we feel about eradicating the puberty of children and um, eradicating their fertility, I think we can say that as a country, we very much turned a corner and there is a huge amount to celebrate but there is so much more to do. Um, let's have a look at St. Polly of Carmichael and how she talks about these uncertainties way back in 2016, I think it is, um, and how every single last one of them who went along with puberty blockers at the Tavistock in Portland in this country knew exactly what they were doing. And I can't wait until we get to a point, which we know we won't, right? I can't wait till we get to the point where women like this are criminalised because they all fucking knew what they were doing. All of them. Identify differently or choose to express themselves differently over time. 
And, you know, I would pray that we hang on to the fact that children and adolescents are not adults and that they are developing beings and that we need to be thinking about how we work with them and care for them within a developmental framework. Within a, de- within a developmental framework and how we still give them puberty blockers, even though I'm giving a very cautious speech here in which I know that I'm absolutely obliterating their tiny healthy bodies on behalf of the NHS. So within our service, the pathways are individual and the pathways can change over time. In terms of what we do, I guess just a brief rundown to resonate with what I was saying about equity of access. We have a multidisciplinary team and we often see the young people in pairs so their families can be seen separately. We help children encourage each other and use the right language when they're in sessions. So, um, yeah, so we, what we do when a child comes in is we focus on them so much that they have two members of our team um, at all times so that they really do get absolutely saturated in attention and that becomes a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. We see for an assessment between roughly three and six sessions and I will... Uh, I think, um, oh, what do they call that, Polly? Oh, bullshit. I think they say bullshit. Roughly three to six sessions. Why would you say roughly when you're dealing in a clinical setting? Why is it roughly? when we actually know it was often less. Alone, I personally would not feel comfortable meeting with a family on one occasion and be recommending physical interviews. But what I am happy about doing is going on a CBBC programme and telling the lie to all the little boys and girls that they can freeze their eggs and they can just pause their puberty. And what we know is that it's definitely reversible. So I'm okay about going and saying that on children's TV. Interventions. We have a network model um, with liaison with local services, as I've described, but we've also found incredibly valuable um, group days and family days. And this is really an opportunity for families and young people to not feel so isolated. This is a really good way of totally affirming and conditioning those children into thinking that they are a special sort of child and not like anyone else. So what we do is we put all the children that we might say that they have a registered birth because we're fucking morons. We might say they have a registered birth and what we might do is we might put them all together so they can feed off each other and have competitive transness. And to gain support from each other in a safe space. Are you a boy? Are you a boy? Are you a girl? Why are you a girl? Are you non-binary? Have you had your breast cut off? Are you going to have your winky cut off? That's the sort of thing we like to totally promote at the Tavistock. We obviously provide physical intervention and referral on to adult services. But our work is very much about whatever a young person's pathway within the service, maintaining a holistic approach so there is ongoing contact with the clinicians in the gender service to promoting. I just want to say that if you are serious, anyone, whether it's Cass, whether it's Polly of Carmichael, um, whoever you are, if you genuinely want to stop this harm to children, why would you keep a specialist service as if there is something about this that is real? Why? Why would you do that? Why would you have a gender service if not to reinforce the idea that there is such a thing as gender and that you can be transgender? Why would, why would you have that service? Why? Inclusions, think about relationships and ameliorate negative impacts on general developmental post- processes a lot of words isn't it what does she mean ameliorate does she mean the fact that these kids aren't going through normal puberty that they can somehow catch up with normal puberty and have a normal experience with other kids who are also being poisoned with puberty blockers is that what she means
groups, but also crucially to provide opportunities to explore gender identity as a young person develops and perhaps is exposed to other people. Gender identity, Polly Carmichael uses it. Polly Carmichael headed up the Tavistock. The Tavistock neutered children, both as sexual function and fertility. Right? That was her. <laughs> that was her job. And she did it very, very well. Um, if you're still talking about gender identity, I just I just don't think you're serious. I think I I just think you have to be hardline. I just I just think you have to be hardline. All different ideas and different ways of being and think about their expression and then the choices they have and the implications of those choices, both for the present, but also for the future. And what we know is that no child actually has any concept of what it might like be to be a 20 year old or 25 year old unable to get an erection or have an orgasm. And we all knew this and we still did it. And they all knew it. They all knew it. We've known this for years and I'm no one, <laughs> apparently. But I'm nobody. I'm not a medic. I'm not involved in this. And can I say that for me, this was a second issue that I came across. The first thing that I came across was erasing women in our language. I had no idea, like most of you, that they were doing this to children. Like that was that was news to me when I found out about it, that they were actually doing this to kids. Informed consent, I think moving forward, we're all aware is key and going to be an important, you know, issue. Did she just say informed consent about children? Did she? Pedophile information exchange quite quite like those ideas about teaching children more about sex and they could consent to it. Funny, isn't it? What a crossover. But in terms of some of the things I've mentioned, some of the associated difficulties, the developmental framework, the very different places young people are in, the huge diversity of young people that attends our service. Children. She means fucking children. And I don't mean actually having uh, raping kids. Um, she's talking about children. She's not like this this young people thing. They're caught they're talking about children. It is hard to start thinking about, but we must, what information is required at what point? Does one need to know about surgery if you're a young person considering cross-sex hormones? Children, if you're a child. Considering cross-sex hormones. Child. If you're thinking about the blocker, do you need to be thinking about cross-sex hormones? You know, we really need to be thinking about what information young people need at what point that is going to be impacted. So this is, this, is, this is what was happening, right? This is, this, is what we're ha this is what is happening. This is what's been happening. This is what was happening. And I, I do have a little bit of fear that the reason the cast review wasn't better in my eyes is because it really does put all of these people that went along with it in a really bad light. Because I think each and every one of them knew it was bullshit. And I don't know if the cast review wants to, to do that. And I might be wrong. And I'm going to say it before, I'm going to say it again. We are better off today than we were yesterday. There is a touch point with which we can say, look, we said there was, you know, weak evidence. What we mean is no evidence, but, you know, she said weak evidence, so weak evidence. Um, and she was thorough and she took four years, right? So great. Isn't that whoopee do? But it's this sort of, this sort of stuff that they already knew. They knew when she's talking about uh, you know, a child, or she says young person, a child has to decide, do I take cross-sex hormones? What about puberty blockers? Blah, 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 blah. And she sort of says, what information do they need and when? I mean, even that is so sin sinister. You're, she's basically saying they won't actually really understand everything. So just give them a little bit. So there can never have been informed consent ever. 
And they can't any, anyway because it's a child. But anyone going through this, if you have to talk about their um, comprehension levels and how much information you give, then I think that gives you an idea that they, they aren't old enough for any of it. Powering in order to allow them to make these very complex decisions. And I applaud earlier the thought that, you know, it's not about putting the onus on young people to make the decisions. It's about a collaboration and a trust, I would hope, to share those. Yes. So it's not about putting all the blame on the young people, just a lot of the blame. Um, but I have recognised here that it is also the blame of their silly parents and their doctors and GPs and mealy-mouthed people who say shut up even though they knew exactly what was going on. But I haven't said that it's not the young person's responsibility at all. If you listen, I said they collaborate in their own demise. We're also, as I said, keen to continue with CPD. And can I, can I just say, and I know all you lovely, rabid women on the uh, far left, I'd like to talk about this, but I think Gillick competence is a gateway drug into informed consent. So if you don't like it, I'm here on a Tuesday evening. You can ring in and tell me why. But I am right about this. I'm right about everything. And I'm right about this events and wider work because I believe that the context in which we work, the wider context of society is going to be crucial in terms of the choices open to young people. And so the way we groom everybody through CBBC and other channels, uh, Drag Queen Storytime, let's push that. Um, loads of stuff on social media. So if we can saturate everything, uh, we might be able to get away with it for another eight years. So I do believe that is part of our work. She believes part of our work is to convince the wider population that we should sterilise kids. She is a, I don't care what any of you say, she is a hero. In terms of physical interventions, following assessment, we have a care plan agreed with the young person and family. And we take, according to the guidelines, a staged approach to physical treatments. We cut off their breasts. Uh, first of all, we smash their breasts up with a binder. Um, we eradicate their sexual function and uh, any puberty. So they really don't get on with their peers. So when they're really the most isolated, we, we smash their breasts to pieces with a binder. Then we cut them off. Um, then what we do, and I'm so happy about the new clinic coming along, is we sever most of their arm. Um, we fashion it into a tube. We stuff it with some tissue. Um, a bit like when you used to go to the school disco and you stuff it with some tissue and you sew it on, sometimes as high as the belly button. Um, it never works. And then we sew up their vagina a little bit like FGM. We offer the blockers from Tan Stage 2. Buck up their bodies first and their brains. And that's based on um, stage of puberty, not on age. We offer, at the moment, cross-sex hormones from 16. Then what we do is we make them have some irreversible changes on top of that. Um, but girls, you won't believe this, helps crumble their bones. So, and, and for boys, um, helps them mentally anxious and um, like a sniveling wreck. So, oh, there's so many, there's so many times I look back on on myself um, as the leader of the mutilation clinic in London um especially for children and I think how did I get away with this oh I know because everybody else was silent using a gradually increasing dose and surgery in the UK is not available until adult services about 40 percent of referrals to the child and adolescent service go forward to the end associated endocrine clinics so by no means all young people so out of every 10 that come through our doors, we manage to put them, four out of them, on a lifetime of drugs. It's a very proud moment in my career. Oh, and about 25% of... Can I just say, I just want to recognise Sue and Marcus Evans, right? Sue Evans raised the alarm on this in 2006. 
So 40% of people that have been going through those doors at the Tavistock, and we know it goes up to really crazy numbers, but 40% of them actually end up having their fertility eradicated, their bodies mutilated, um, and their sexual function uh, just evaporated, right? How many children do you think would have been saved had they listened to Sue Evans way back in 2006? The prepubertal young people who are presenting to the service prepubertally, that is referred before the... Little children still at primary school. We love them. ...age of 12 go forward to the clinic. But it has also to be borne in mind that the majority of referrals, as I said, have already started or are well into puberty. So... Damn it! Oh, all those kickbacks from Lupron. You can't even bloody capitalise on it. Ah, oh, damn it. To end, I just want to raise some points, really, for us to think about. So I want you to bear in mind that the CAS review still doesn't say this all should absolutely stop. It says that as part of experiment, as part of sort of clinical experiments and trials, this can still be done. And also she talks about extreme caution. So it doesn't say no. It just doesn't. It doesn't say that it shouldn't ever happen. It says extreme caution. And I would argue that a lot of doctors and GPs and therapists have convinced themselves already that they do this with extreme caution. And you have to remember the lobby groups and the activists have been telling these doctors, and they've been totally convinced on this, that the other side of not doing this is suicide. And I suppose, firstly, rationale of the blocker. Are all aspects fully reversible? Is anything really fully reversible? They fucking knew. They knew all along. If you don't do something, it has an effect. If you do do something, it has an effect. And also, we're working within a developmental trajectory. So yeah, we're working with guinea pigs. Oh, no, children, children, guinea pigs. Disposable. So things are changing all the time. However, I think we had the view of the blocker as a diagnostic aid. It was also a time to try and alleviate distress. And this I They knew it wasn't reversible. And they say that they were using it as a diagnostic aid. I just want to know, and pardon my language, who the fuck did they all think they were? Really? Who did they think they were? Pissing around with children. Like, all human experiments, I think we can agree, are pretty horrendous. But you mess around with a 12-year-old, they've got to live with that for 70, 80 years. If they live that long. I got this completely wrong. <laughs> to explore and understand more and consolidate. This is why you shouldn't have specialist services for this bullshit. You should just treat those children like any others. They are no different. They are not more special. They are not more distressed. They are not more traumatized than anyone else. We have a screwed up generation of children. Perhaps I'm just too fucking arrogant to have ever gone along with any of it. If somebody had said to me, if a teacher had tried to tell me about my children for a start, that would have been number one kind of big error. Number two, if I went to a doctor and a doctor decided that something that was, that my child was really some sort of gender bullshit, I just wouldn't go along with it. I mean, maybe I'm just lucky that I know my own mind and I'm confident in, in what I know. But this is insane. Support young people to be thinking about their next step. It is Do you want your tits off, um, Kai? Should we cut your breasts off and your nipples? I mean, do you want a straight line? Do you want two scars? Do you want nipples, no nipples? Do you want something from your underarm right the way across? We could do a lovely deep scar. Yeah. Oh, 
if you want, we could try and match it with all the self-harm scars you've got all over your arms and stomach and chest. Would you like us to do that? Um, is that what you're thinking about, next steps? There's a reversible treatment, certainly, insofar as if you stop it, then your pre-programmed milieu resumes. Um, but... I would question whether it is a completely reversible treatment. Are you raging? Because I am. I would question whether the reversible treatment that I said was reversible on CBBC, um, that I also say is reversible to parents when they come in, it's like a pause button is what I say. It's like a pause button. And I've been saying that for a really long time. And I, I've forgotten that I've said that because I'm now in front of a load of people um, who work in this area globally. So even though I say it to my patients, I say it to their their parents, I say it to little kids on their own like TV channels and stuff. Even though I say that, I'm, I, I know that it's probably not true. Um, and my colleagues know it's not true. And, uh, you know, we all have a slice of cake and have a, a, a good old chuckle about the kids that we've mutilated because, you know, no one's going to come after me because, you know, I, I have, I think it's called a white collar. I think it's like protection of being a professional that I've got like a quite good union. I, I can be protected and I can pretend that all this time I wasn't really abusing children through medical practices and procedures. We also have the idea that young people should experience some puberty to turn to stage two. I think that was around the majority of young people presenting to services pre-puberty, not necessarily going forward post-puberty and wanting physical interventions. And so maybe within that, there was some thought that perhaps puberty had a role to play in terms of young people's development in terms of their sense of their gender identity. Can you even? <laughs> I'd... Up to the gender identity bit, I'm just thinking, I just want to keep saying, they all knew. The CAS report may, may be a review or a report. It's not fucking news to Polly Carmichael. It's not news to people working in the gender industry. It's not news to them. They knew they were mutilating children. They all fucking knew it. And they all did it. Some of them did it with their minds open. Some of them did it feeling so, very, so, very, so, very sad about themselves. Some of them felt sad about themselves. Some of them felt sorry for themselves. Some of them raised questions. Some of them knew they shouldn't do it. They still absolutely did it. And they all knew. I think we all, you know, feel the blocker and physical treatments are crucial and vital and have been the biggest step forward for young people. Honestly, I could, I could cry. There's, it's, it's very interesting how we deal with people in this country, right? This woman here headed up a service that obliterated, annihilated, there's a word for you, little lovers of me, annihilated the bodies of children. She did it knowing that the, the certainties that she gave parents and children were bullshit. What parent, well, maybe some of them, but I, I really don't have any sympathy for them either. What parent would go along to a service and be told, right, your, your child may change their mind and that parent wouldn't at least question what they're doing, right? This puberty blocker is not, is not reversible. We don't know that it's reversible rather than it's a pause button. They, they knew. I just want you to bear in mind when we... So many people are celebrating the CAS review and report. Number one, they all knew. And number two, it doesn't go far enough. And let me just say, 
The heroes of this are not published people. They're not the heroes of this. The heroes are the likes of Sue and Marcus Evans, David Bell, Stephanie Davis Arai, Julia Long, Sheila Jeffries, all the women that came before when it was a frosty landscape to speak out against this. Heather Brunskill Evans. But Sue Evans, 2000 and so can you imagine what it's like to be her? In fact, I know what it's like to be her because I spoke with her this afternoon. But 2004 or 2006, she started speaking about this. And then other people interview Sue and Marcus Evans who are willing to go on record. And then they write a book and then I've seen people go, oh my God, that book you wrote, that, that, that everyone owes you everything. No, they don't. They don't. Whistle blew in 2005. People reporting on the expertise of others are not experts. They're just not. And certainly their use, which was pioneered in Holland, um, has been incredibly successful. But actually, the Dutch <sighs> are the... This abuser. This child abuser. Is that a terrible thing to say? Is that libelous? Defamatory? Did she abuse children? Oh, yes. Yeah, she did. Yeah, yeah, she did. She did. And also, don't think that for a minute that everything is resolved because it's up to the NHS. So, this is a little bit of the stock. This is the sort of stuff they were putting out in 2016. Um, and I just, I just want you to know, I just want you to see how they went along with the culture. And, and Penny, Penny Carmichael was known to say that she was instructed and uh, I believe she said she was bullied, I'm happy to be corrected on that, by mermaids. My mate Susie Green. Okay, we on? We're on. You spin. We're recording. Okay. What was it like being filmed? I would explain it as a 10 out of 10 situation. Because it was fun, to be honest. Are you asking yourself, where is this boy now? Because I am. Why did you want to share your story with everyone? Because I think people needed to know. I wanted to be on it to share reasons about um, how transgender is and how like it can change you. A lot of other trans kids can't be transgender and this would be a great film to make to explain that then So I just wanna be clear here. This is what we've done to hundreds, if not thousands of children in this country. And for most of that time, if not the whole time, people knew it, well, it was a lie. They knew it was not reversible. They knew that it would have really devastating consequences. And in other areas of the world, they are doing this wholesale on an industrial level. But just, just take a breath and just watch this boy and just, just think that we did this to him knowing it was bullshit. I'm not alone. So did you talk to your mum lots before you decided to be in the documentary? Because that's a big decision, isn't it? It is a really big decision, yeah. But... Once you do it, you don't feel you don't feel that shy no more. You've done it, and you're like, oh, good to get it off your chest. She enjoyed the whole thing. It has really boosted her confidence a lot. Has it doing it? Oh yeah, definitely. What putting a putting a vulnerable kid who pretends to be the opposite sex on the telly? That's a great idea, Mum. Even just you guys, just the film crew understanding her. I think because it was. There's not a lot of people that's been outside of the family that has 
met her and I've been understanding of the situation. And she knows that once everybody watches it, that hope. This woman would have taken her son to the Tavistock and the whole bullshit belief system would have been endorsed and affirmed and supported and it was a special service, so it must be true. Must be loads of kids, right? Must be loads of kids doing it if there's a special service. Hopefully, even if 20% of the people that watch it will understand. Can't you go to school tomorrow and your friends ask you what you thought of the documentary that you yeah. watched? What will yeah. you say? I'm going to say big thumbs up because it was actually it was actually not as bad as I thought it would be. I thought I would cry, but it actually made me laugh really hard. <laughs> there comes a point at which you actually need to tell your story to everybody to try and make people understand. What you see in the documentary really is a taste of, you know, what daily life is like. And we do have the likes of people like Caitlyn Jenner who have highlighted uh, transition and transgender individuals, but it doesn't show, for me, it doesn't show how difficult it really is. So the decision was a hard one, but the positives outweigh the negatives. If it was the other way round, we wouldn't have taken part. I'm looking forward to seeing the reaction and um, yeah, I really... I'm looking forward to receiving, like all the reaction and adulation, which is why we chose to do it, because, you know, my daughter has decided to be a boy and I'm going along with it. And so as long as, you know, I get some attention myself, I'm happy. I enjoyed it. I was, I was really quite happy about it and I know that Matt has seen the documentary as well and thinks he's an absolute legend. Matt wanted to take part because it was, well, if I can show everybody, I won't have to tell anybody. And if nobody asks me any more questions, then it may be easier for me to sort of find my place in society. Because what Matt's really saying is she can't answer the questions because they're too difficult because it's difficult keeping up a lie, knowing you're not actually a boy. So there we have it. So... To reiterate, it's a wonderful thing. I can't tell my face. It's a wonderful thing, the cast report. Um, just not enough. It's just not enough. <sighs> anyway, um, I really hope that you understand what's going on and that we just need more accountability. We just need government departments answering why they did this to kids. Um, and it's gone to government, right? It's all under the... It's not even, is it? it it's obviously under the Labour government that it started because if Sue Evans is, is um, whistleblowing in 2005, then that was a Labour government. And then the Tories kind of ran with it. And they injected it into every single place in our society through state-funded institutions and organizations, and they're all still going to be teaching kids it. We just now are going to feel like children are martyrs because they really have to live in their terrible bodies. So what's going to happen? Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. They might not be allowed to take puberty blockers, so it'll just be a boy in girls' clothes, not a boy that's taking hormones in girls' clothes in your daughter's spaces. Uh, they just, you know, they, they, we won't be like irreversibly damaging an in individual child at the age of 12, but schools are still going to let him in your daughter's changing room. The police are still going to tell you off for your naughty words. Men are still going to be violent when we go and speak in the street. This is a battle and I believe it's this particular battle. Um has had a, a, a mighty good victory.
but the war is far from over. So I hope you're in for the long haul because I think it's going to be a mighty long time until we get the sort of solutions that I think we want, repealing the GRA, no men into, um, no men in women-only spaces at all. Um, here at Let Women Speak, we've been talking about schools for a really, really long time and what they do and how there, there is a lack of parental rights and how we're, it's being stolen from us. And I want to see this out of schools. I want to see this out of the police. I don't want any state-funded, to start with, I don't want any state-funded institution endorsing this ideology at all. Not one. Um, and then number two, what I would like to see is that all other places follow suit because that's what, what, what will happen and I want the GRA to be repealed. And until we have those, those final wars, until I can plant a woman adult human flag at the top of that particular hill, um, we haven't won. Anyway. If you can stick to the truth, you can hold it right next to your beating heart and not let it go and not concede, not cede a single second moment, tiny morsel of a word. I promise we will win. If you can continue to use truthful language, Not say her for a man. Not call a man a trans woman. Use the word man. Every opportunity you have, then I promise we will win. And do you know why else we're going to win? Because I never... Lose.